Our presentation today is atavism. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to dive right in and talk a little bit about um, where I work and, and what the mission of um, what I do is all about. Um, so I am a professor of computer science at Spelman College. For those not familiar, Spelman College is one of four institutions that form the uh, Atlanta University Center, right? the other institutions being Morehouse, um, Morehouse School of Medicine and Clark Atlanta. These are relatively small schools, collectively about 8,000 students between the four of them. Three of these schools are small liberal arts colleges and one of them is a medical school, the uh, Morehouse School of Medicine. While these schools remain you know, dedicated to their mission of a liberal arts education or in the case of MSM, uh, uh, medical school education, there is a recognition that computer technology has become so important, so pervasive, and so central to so many of the disciplines that these colleges um, are teaching that in the year 2019, graduating without some exposure to coding or, or how to exploit this technology um, leaves a student at a competitive disadvantage. And so my challenge as the interim chair of the computer science department at Spelman, and I think I speak for all the other schools, is how do we take a scarce resource of, in this case, computer science faculty, there's six and a half of us at, at Spelman, how do we take that resource and teach computer programming and coding techniques to a diverse group of students? We have art majors, we have biology majors, we have math majors, economics majors, how do we do it? Well. The reality is we can't do it by ourselves with the group that we have. So we are dependent on leveraging the expertise of the different fields, the different majors, and the different departments on campus to help us out. So we've initiated a program with our art department where we teach coding with using processing, right? which is just visual base uh, way of, of writing programs. We teach the biology students with R. Right? So we have enlisted the help of a biology faculty member that is, that is grounded in computational biology and bioinformatics to help us design a program for biology students. And the idea is to do this for all the different disciplines, or as many who are willing, to create what we call you know, algorithmic thinking. We're not really trying to teach anybody how to code in any particular language. We just want to give them this idea about how a program comes together. How do you take a complex problem, break it down into its small constituent parts so that a dumb machine like a computer can execute it? What you're gonna hear is our first efforts into trying to do the same thing with the music department. How do we make coding relevant? How do we make algorithmic thinking relevant for music majors? And that, coupled with the, the, the added impetus of getting data analytics and data science into the, the curriculum, that is what you're going to hear about today. This, this project, Atavism, encapsulates all of that. Algorithmic thinking, data, data analysis, data visualization, all into one package. And it's something that I hope, once we polish it, has some application in the K-12 space as well. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm gonna be quiet and sit down and I'm gonna let the experts in the field take over. <laughs> Okay, hi, I'm, I'm Aaron Carterenyi, and um, Jerry is, is being very humble because actually the whole uh, genesis of this project was under his program called the Faculty Learning Community that uh, brought um, faculty from various fields together in, in the Innovation Lab, which he is also the director of. So uh, he, he really um, uh, generates so much of this interdisciplinary efforts. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm really Happy to, to have been a part of that. I'm just a new faculty member, and he's been a, a great mentor to me. So in the faculty learning community uh, a few years ago, uh, one thing that came out of it was an algorithm that I had written was the basis of my dissertation, but actually doing something with it and actually uh, making uh, it educational. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. And then William Dula, um, who was an undergraduate at Morehouse, now he's a, a graduate student at Clark. Um, he's been working on the project since he was undergraduate. So he'll, he's been uh, leading the Python um, uh, translation and deployment of it 
um, because I'm more of a MATLAB person, although he's teaching me um, some Python along the way. So that's basically what we're talking about tonight. Um, so I want to start off by um, giving you some concepts from um, psychology and linguistics. Um, in addition to, we'll mostly be talking about data science and visualization. But um, first of all, I want to um, talk about gestalts. And um, many people may be familiar with that term or maybe not. But basically, it's about how the brain forms categories and how we group things together, like cars. You know, we all know what a car, cars come in a lot of shapes, but you know, when we see a car, we know that's a car, right? Um, so this is something I actually don't have a name for. Um, it looks like some sort of tool. Um, it has a handle and maybe some sort of implement, some sort of stamp-like thing. And so you see here some various ways that this can be transformed. It can be rotated. I think we would still agree that those all still belong to the same category. Now this one's a little different because it's kind of recombined. The little kind of pulled out part, little chunked out part is, is put in the handle or in the implement and the implement's turned around. Um, in C you kind of see these kind of warping. Um, and then in D you've, you know, see various kind of visual distortion. Um, anybody venture to guess? which of these categories would conventionally be considered gestalt and which, if any, would be not. So we're just trying to f form a category, you know, where you see, you know, everything in A belongs together, everything B belongs together, everything in C, everything in D belongs together, or maybe not. Is there any? Okay, were they rotated? Anyone else? Okay, well, um, I guess my own personal thought is B because they're kind of recombined. These others, you know, the, the C is just kind of warped, D it's distorted, but um, A, you know, rotated, but it's, it's B where the actual parts are recombined. And this is, you know, the uh, kind of famous saying which is misquoted, and I'm going to misquote, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and that's actually not the right German translation, but I can't remember what the right one is, but that's the idea here. Um, because those parts are recombined, it's not the same whole. So we also talk about gestalts in music. Um, music is experienced in time, so they're called temporal gestalts. And so uh, music theory in my field is very mathematical, and so one thing we talk about a lot that's also talked about in mathematics is equivalence classes. Um, and so in particular, we're going to talk about uh, musical themes as equivalence classes and as temporal gestalts. So we're already doing both psychology and mathematics because temporal gestalt is the psychological term, equivalence class would be the mathematical term. Um, there's some very long-standing equivalence classes within, or equivalence relations within music. One is absolute pitch. You know, if I play Mary Had a Little Lamb, then I play it again, they're pitch equivalent. I just played the same order of pitches. There's also transpositional equivalence. But then, so that means that all of the musical intervals, which are based on math as well, um, harmonic ratios, um, are preserved um, even in that as it's shifted to another key. Then there's a more recent phenomenon that's based on ethnomusicology and uh, neuroscience, cognitive science, which is contour, and that would be where the shape is preserved but not the frequency ratios. Okay, so the shape is preserved, and this is something um, that people that can't match pitch um, uh, often do, is when they sing back a melody, they'll get the shape right, the ups and downs, but they will not get um, the frequency ratios right. So contour is really, the shape of a melody is really somewhat independent from the key of a melody, for instance. However, none of those pitch classes really work great for pattern finding, and that's what we're going to talk about today in pattern discovery. So this is um, one of the most famous melodies, with, at least within classical music, that we um, study a lot um, in music theory classes. Uh, Bach is, of course, you know, the giant within um, um, our curriculum, our music theory curriculum, and music theory is usually music majors have to take about four semesters of it. Here is the subject 
which is just a, a fancy word for theme that's specific to fugues, and the subject from Bach's C minor fugue. And so he first states it in C minor, So if we just compare the subject to itself, that would be pitch equivalent. Those two things are exactly the same. But actually, um, Bach does all sorts of statements of it. Um, here is a statement in the relative major. Okay, so it might have sounded happier or kind of a little more uplifting than the first minor version. And so um, I already mentioned there's a transpositional equivalence class, which would mean that all the intervals, the relation, the frequency ratios between notes were preserved, but that's actually not the case with this. So it's not T equivalent, I would call, if it's exactly the same pitch as P equivalent, um, if the intervals are preserved T equivalent, um, but it's actually neither one of those. So it's actually what we would call contour equivalent. So um, contour equivalence is judged by a very complex matrix where you compare every note to every other note for its pitch height. And so both the subject and the relative major statement later in the piece form the same matrix like this of zeros and ones. But then there's even another statement of the theme in this piece that is not even contour equivalent, yet most listeners consider it gestalt. So how do we form an uh, equivalence class for that? And that's something I've been working on for about 10 years. So this is how the tonal answer sounds. And the tonal answer is a huge subject within music theory because it's not only, well, it's very prominent within the piece. The subject is stated at the very opening, and we're going to hear the whole piece in a minute, but then the tonal answer comes right after it, or a real answer. Now, a real answer would be exactly transposed. But a tonal answer is not only transposed, but it's also modified. Okay. So it's taken to the dominant, but also, um, but not only transposed, but also modified quite a bit. So it's neither transpositional or contour equivalent. Tovey um, has called it an adaptation to the dominant, as opposed to a transposition. So one thing that is the same between both, and those are just side by side there, is the directional relationships from one note to the next. So if we go from the first to the second note, we go down, then we go up, then we go down, and so on. However, um, this um, syntagmatic equivalence where you just compare one note to the next, it's not a very strong equivalence class because it can lead to melodies that actually don't sound anything like the subject, and that we wouldn't consider equivalent perceptually, like this one. So not really the same theme as this. As the tonal answer is. These uh, pitch, transposition, and contour are all crisp, and then syntag man is too fuzzy. So. Um, I looked for a long time um, for a way to create an equivalence class that would really capture themes, um, and that's the basis for the software we're going to talk about. And where I went to figure this out was Nigeria, actually, and I spent um, two years there from 2013 to 14, and I'm going back uh, this next year for a year. Um, so Nigeria is really special because it has 500 languages, and they're um, which is about a twelfth of the world's languages, and their tonal languages, which is, um, we forget that 60% of the world's languages are tonal um, because the world is so dominated by English, um, and actually English and German are some of the really exceptions. Uh, the Indo-European languages are the exception in terms of being tone languages, and I'll explain what that means a little more. So in particular, Yoruba and Igbo are uh, two languages that are the two most widely spoken tone languages in Africa um, with about 30 million speakers each. You know, there was a lot of missionary work and Christianization um, in the 19th century to 20th century, and one of the things they found out, um, actually missionaries would, would take European hymns and they would translate them metrically, meaning we want the same number of syllables in our translation so we can sing it to the same tune, but they would forget that actually the, the pitch and the contour mattered as much as the rhythm. 
or the number of syllables. So an example is, all hail the power of Jesus' name, which translates into Igbo as, oha kele ike jesu. And so the contour, um, you know, it has a melody to it, is like this. Oha kele ike jesu. So basically we have low, 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 high, 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 low. And then when it's sung to the common hymn tune from Europe, it sounds like this. Oha kele ike jesu. The hymn was supposed to mean, all hail the power of Jesus' name, but when it's sung to these tunes, um, oha, all is changed to oha, trees, and ike, which means strength, is changed to ike, which means buttocks, okay? <laughs> so this was a really common problem uh, throughout West Africa, which has a lot of tone languages. So one way to fix this is just to kind of recom um, recompose the melody a little bit. Or just compose an all new melody. So, this is a very uh, important part of vocal music in Nigeria and throughout Africa, where there's tone languages, is to compose melodies that reflect how the speech would occur. And that's basically the inspiration um, for what we're, um, what I need to wrap up and <laughs> talking about tonight. So, here's some other examples that are kind of uh, amusing. Supposed to mean come to morning prayer, means come to prayer, it's crippled when you sing to that melody. So uh, what we're doing um, tonight is um, really um, drawing on um, kind of a very interdisciplinary uh, look at sound, both music and language, and really uh, a cross-cultural solution. The inspiration for this algorithm actually very much came from this excerpt from a Yoruba sermon where the pastor is saying the same thing over and over again, um, but the tone levels kind of compress and shift around. Okay, and so one thing that's been misunderstood about tone languages by very prominent psychologists is that they're based on absolute pitch, and they're not, they're based on contour. And so we can see that very clearly here, and so we have a high level, a mid level, and a low level all kind of shift around through the course of a phrase, yet they're phonologically equivalent. So I've spent a lot of time figuring out how to do that mathematically, and this is what I came up with. If we look at the first syllable and put it within a window of three syllables, um, it, is, it gets a value of one because it is higher than one other thing within its window. If you look at the second within that same window, it is higher than one other thing in this window. And note that it's the same for all three repetitions. We're trying to figure out how all three of those repetitions are equivalent. Say, um, so for the next one, zero, because it's the lowest thing within its window. Next one, two, because it's higher than everything else in its window, and so on. All three phrases produce the same numerical series, okay? So if we take this, apply it to Bach, back to the subject and tonal answer. That's the top. Here's the bottom. And we can actually use a bigger window. Here I'm using a window of five. The first note in both cases is higher than three other things in its window. The second note is higher than two other things within its window and so on, it's very simple. And so now we have an equivalence class that can recognize an adaptation, okay? Um, and that's based on African tone languages and the idea of tone levels. So this new equivalence class, I call it the L equivalence class, is fuzzy, yet it's gestalt, okay? So that's, that's very important. Without any supervision at all, you can just put in the data from Boxwell Tempered Clavier, it's 48 pieces and it recognizes all the fugue subjects. So we've taken this algorithm and this L equivalence class and we've um, applied visualization to it um, from Wattenberg, who's uh, the head of Google's big picture project along with another fellow. 
Um, he came up with this great visualization approach, these arc diagrams. So his example from his 2001 article uses Mary Had a Little Lamb. So you can see the big arc there is where that da 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 comes back. So we have da 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 da, and then it connects it to da 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 da. And so he planned to deploy a software on this, but it turned out it didn't work very well because he was basing it on exact pitch equivalents. And as we've already established, most composers, most popular musicians, don't always repeat the musical theme the same way. You know, music is very much repetition with variation. So this works fine for Mary Had a Little Lamb, but if you're going to get into other music, it didn't work so well. So um, von Wadenberg um, eventually abandoned the project, although he still got a sweet job at Google, I guess. We've employed this kind of African-centered um, engine um, based on the tone levels, and then we get something much more effective. So I'm just going to briefly go through a few examples for you, um, and I hope you won't mind that we're going just a few minutes over, but these musicians came to actually play the examples for you. So once again, um, here's the Bach, and there's the numerical representation. I won't bore you with it again, but we have all these binary comparisons that make um, Bach's variations on his themes equivalent mathematically, which makes our pattern finding much, much stronger and very efficient, is the other thing. Um, because once you start messing with similarity metrics, um, it becomes very, very complicated. A is similar to B, and B is similar to C, but it doesn't follow that A is similar to C then. Whereas with equivalence, A equals B, B equals C, and A equals C. So that's why an equivalence class is so powerful and so efficient computationally. Here's the um, arc diagram based on Wadenberg's visualization, and then um, our algorithm based on African tone levels. So, uh, here's a performance by Glenn Gould, and you're actually going to see the the um, visualization. Places of MIDI data and no other information about the piece, the algorithm can easily find that that's the dominant pattern within a matter of seconds because of the equivalence class. And then that makes Wadenberg's visualization approach much more uh, meaningful because actually if we use his original algorithm of pitch matching, it would only have one arc because there's only one exact pitch repetition. Now there are subjects that um, have some uh, deletions and insertions. For instance, this fugue, which is later in the set. And here's a variation. However, with edit distance, which is used in DNA and other things, um, you can accommodate those. So another application is sonata form. And this is actually a student's project on what is a very familiar sonata. So that's the opening theme, which comes back here, but in transposition.
So that's uh, one way to use the software in a very conventional uh, theory class. Then we also use it for less conventional things like jazz that usually uh, defies uh, music theory's techniques. So this is um, Dizzy Gillespie and so Ridge White, who is a junior at uh, Morehouse and actually has completed all the, his music theory requirements, so he's well on his way uh, to graduation, is going to play the theme from Blue Moon. Now, Dizzy Gillespie, a bebop improviser, does a lot um, with this um, theme um, in terms of uh, quoting the, the, uh, the shape, the contour of it. Um, so now Ridge is going to play us. Um, these are patterns that the um, algorithm found um, that quoted the theme. That's an inversion, and it recognizes inversions, too. So the thing about um, the, the contour algorithm is you can use a small window size, which is very inclusive, or a larger window size, which is more exclusive. You could argue that maybe not all of these are gestalt, but it seems very clear that, um, and we know um, just from you know, more ethnographic um, knowledge of jazz, that, that improvisers quote um, the theme in different ways. Uh, quotation and illusion is a big part of jazz improvisation. So this opens up, uh, you know, a whole new realm in terms of analysis. Where, as you know, music theory hasn't always been, uh, you know, very prepared for that. There's only one other music theorist here, I think. So I'm, I'm not going to worry about bashing music theory too much. Okay, he says it's okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so here is the art diagram. And so we know this is the opening uh, melody right there. D Blue moon, you saw me standing alone um, right there. So even the, the, the main theme has recursion within itself. But then we also see that da 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 quoted in different areas. That's the blue arcs. It found about 30, once again, a very inclusive group. And you know, it, you might debate how much those are actually perceptually equivalent. We need to research that. You know, that's where the cognitive science comes in. And then our last performance before we wrap up, some of you may have heard of the Morehouse College Glee Club, a wonderful ensemble, often performs with the Atlanta Symphony, also performs all over the world. So each year, we commission a new piece of music by a African composer that's written in indigenous languages and based on secular themes. Um, and so this year, the composer that won uh, was Ayo Oluranti, 
and he wrote a piece called Omoluabi that's based on seven proverbs. So right now, Quintina will first um, read the proverb and tell you its meaning, then BC will play it on the talking drum. So the, the talking drum is a speech surrogate, and the whole idea is that because Yoruba, Igbo, other languages um, are tonal, are melodic languages, that you actually can transmit the language over long distances with instruments like the talking drum. So as we go, I'll have the arcs and where each proverb appears in the piece. So the first one is Iwa Lessing, which means character is religion. The second one, Iwa Loba Awure, which means supplication is important. Iwa Lorisha, which means character is God, which also means um, it's a way of saying character is salient. Kawi Be, Kagba Be, Inyi Enionie, which means a man is honorable when his word is his bond. The next one goes, Iwarere ni esho enio, which means good conduct is an ornament. Eyinfufu ni esho ering, which means the value of a smile is in the whiteness of the teeth. Omoluabi, it means the child begotten by the master or the god. The next one goes, Tiabaoje Oshaka, Kakukuje Oshaka, It means be certain without doubt. Biabaoje Oshoko, Kakukuje Oshoko. Oshaka Oshoko Koyeni. And that means being neither here nor there is undesirable. And that's the end. And I'll just let you listen to a little bit of the choir's interpretation. William Dula, who's been working on this project for two years and um, basically is going to make this uh, reach the people. Possibly, uh, well, we wrote in our grant uh, 300,000 music students in the US. So he's the man to make that happen um, because he's been taking the MATLAB code and translating it to Python, uh, which makes this appropriate for a PyData presentation, although that's not, I guess, the rule, as Rob said. Um, so William Dula. <laughs> Okay, so as Dr. Cardini um, mentioned, uh, we already have a MATLAB runtime version that he has created uh, and is available in JOS. We need to move this project 
into an arena that allows for all educators of all different backgrounds and all different kinds of resources uh, to gain access to this uh, software. And so that's what I'm doing. Uh, just a little bit to talk about the, uh, the, the main algorithm as it is right now. Um, so we bring in uh, whatever the piece is uh, via MIDI data. Um, and then we pass it through the, the sort of windowing sort of function, the, the building that binary matrix of binary comparisons. And then, so there are kind of two options, and it depends on the user, what the user wants. Um, if you know there are patterns that you were looking for, you can say, hey, here's this pattern, go find all the repetitions of it, and that would be the sort of left branch. And then you get your nice arc diagram, um, very beautiful, very lovely. Um, but we can also take it the other direction, we can just let the algorithm find patterns. Um, and you can say how many patterns you want to find, you can say how big, how wide you want the window to be, um, so how ex exclusive or inclusive you want those patterns to be. Um, and then it sort of pulls all these comparisons and generates a list, um, generates a list of all the possible patterns, and then uh, we get the nice arc plot which shows where they come back up. Um, and so those are kind of like the two, two ways that we have right now. Um, particularly with pattern discovery, however, there are lots of ways you could take it. Um, so there are different ways to think about rank, different ways to think about comparison, different ways to think about all these sorts of ideas. And one of the things we want to do going forward is allow students to make those decisions, make those suggestions, make their own sort of pipelines um, in order to discover patterns and whatnot. And so these things could be contour based, they could be pitch based, they could be key based, rhythm based, um, so sort of temporal uh, time based. Uh, they could be chord based, so looking at more of like a vertical representation of music. Um, all these sorts of things are relevant to various studies of music at various different points of uh, their education. And so we want to allow them to sort of design their own analysis, design their own system uh, in which to glean something meaningful from the pieces. Um, so once we have that, right, once we have that, the, uh, the question is, well, what do we do with it? Um, so currently, uh, I'm in the sort of in stages of the translation. Um, and so I'm working on that last little pattern recognition bit. And then once we do that and we have a nice little downloadable version, um, we're kind of going to work on that, tweak that, and add in this sort of uh, augmentation of the algorithm, allowing students to add diff create different metrics or select different metrics, order them, um, so order the importance. So um, is pitch more important right here? Is contour more important right here? Sort of in what order should the algorithm uh, look at these patterns and uh, consider their value? Um, and so the goal is to have that done by August, because in August we will be hosting a training session for music educators. Um, we have educators coming from? Um, Florida State, Michigan, UGA, and Emory. Yeah. So we're going to be helping them uh, learn how to use this, uh, particularly the downloadable version, so they can learn how to get the Python set up and whatnot. And then they can deploy it in their own classrooms and incorporate it into their pedagogy. The next step will then be to deploy it on the web, because um, we want a wide range of music educators, and maybe not, perhaps not just music educators in the states, um, to be able to access this, this, this uh, tool. Um, so we're going to deploy that on the web, and we've talked about a few different things. Uh, last time we came to Pi Data and presented a lightning talk on this, um, we got some nice suggestions. And if anyone else has any more suggestions as to how we might want to deploy this Python app uh, on the web, uh, Feel free to let us know. Feel free to give us some tips and advice. Um, and then, going even further, going beyond that into the far future, um, what we want to be able to do is sort of collate all this user data. All right. So we're going to have, in theory, you know, these 300,000 music students in the U.S. analyzing pieces for class, analyzing pieces perhaps on their own time if they're interested, and looking at all this sort of information. Uh, and then we will have that, all that sort of metadata. Okay, what piece is this? Who is it by? Um, what patterns did you find? Or what patterns were you looking at? All these sorts of things. Where did they occur? And we want to build then a database 
so that further research can be done and, and future machine learning projects can be done using this information. So talking about, oh, what, what kind of patterns does a composer like the most, uh, things like that, or how do their works you know, relate to one another? If we look at, uh, okay, so this work came before this work, came before this work, how do their patterns evolve? All these sorts of studies can be done uh, once we have a large collection of these patterns and of these pieces um, to build off of. And uh, one of the things, again, that was mentioned to us previously um, as far as web deployment was uh, Heroku, which is, I believe, a cloud-based app deployment No, system. we shouldn't do that. Uh, no, no. <laughs> well, we'll, that'll be the discussion. All right. All right. That's part of the discussion. We're not there yet. <laughs> that's like, uh, we're looking at like uh, December, December time. That's when that's going to come. Um, but so this is everything that we're doing in a nutshell. Um, and so I'm going through and helping uh, sort of organize all the code, translate all the code, of course, uh, but then organize it. Um, one of the things I'm going to be working on, focusing on more heavily once I get this downloadable ready, is documentation because we do want people to be able to see this information and access the information in an open source manner um, because that is the entire sort of ethos of this project is very open source in nature. And so definitely want to have some sort of repo available for people to look at, some sort of wiki uh, and documentation in the code and outside of the code, and all these sorts of things um, for the future. And then we just want to improve on it and have other people help us improve on it and make suggestions and whatnot. With that being said, I would like to thank all of you for coming out um, and everyone who helped make this project just, uh, a future success and a current success, I believe, in my opinion, my esteemed opinion. So thank you. Okay.